The U.S. Congressman who's led the charge on the legislative amendments in the U.S. House of Representatives seeking to give India a waiver against armed sanctions is Rokhana. He's a Democrat, uh, Indian American representative from California, member of the U.S. Uh, Armed Services Committee, joining us live in the news track. Congressman, uh, welcome and it's great to have you with us on India Today. Thank you. Uh, an honor to be on. And thank you for your leadership in helping with these Katsa sanctions. There's a lot of concern in India around the countering America's adversaries through uh, Sanctions Act or Katsa and whether uh, the U.S. government will impose these sanctions on India because of the purchase of the S-400 missile defense system. Uh, you're now trying to ensure uh, that this uh, Katsa sanction is not imposed against India. Can you give our viewers a sense of why you believe giving India exemption from Katsa sanctions, which have been invoked in the cases of countries like Turkey, which also are seen as important allies of the United States, why is this a priority for you and for the Democrat government? Well, the United States-India defense partnership economic partnership is one of the most important in the 21st century. It's a partnership of democracies. It's a partnership to make sure that we don't see the expansionist ambitions of China and Taiwan uh, or on the Indian border. Uh, it's a partnership that is necessary in the long run even to check uh, Putin and Putin's advance. So uh, these, uh, this waiver, which passed overwhelmingly in the House of Representatives, over, over 300 votes in the House of Representatives, is an affirmation of the U.S.-India Strategic Alliance. After this, uh, the Katsa waivers are also required to go through the Senate. Can you give our viewers a sense of the mood among senators? Naturally, each will have his own opinion. But is it your sense that, like in the Congress, uh, there was overwhelming support for these sanctions, that that's likely to be the case in the Senate as well? Well, Rahul, as you know, ultimately the decision of whether to waive the sanctions lie with President Joe Biden. Uh, one of the things that the House overwhelmingly voting for this waiver shows is that it gives the president the impetus to waive the sanctions and waive it uh, quickly. Uh, in the Senate, there are many uh, who also believe that the sanctions should be waived. They actually don't have to vote to pass it. What happens is you have a conference committee and the House version, which has the waiver, will be part of it, and the Senate bill uh, will be part of it. The Senate doesn't have the waiver because it passed earlier. And then the committee chairs will decide whether the waiver stays in the final bill. Obviously, we're working to ensure that the waiver stays in the final bill. That would be ideal. But regardless of whether it does, it is an overwhelming signal from the Congress uh, to the President of the United States. And do you have any sense at all of how President Biden views these sanctions against India. He's spoken of India being an important partner to the United States, but there was no clarity before you moved these legislative amendments on how uh, the American government would act on these sanctions and whether they'd proactively work towards giving a waiver. Well, let me just say this. Uh, we've been in touch with very senior members of the White House. Uh, they welcomed the amendment. Had the administration not welcome the amendment, it would never have gotten the kind of support it did in the House of Representatives. So we did this in coordination uh, with very senior people in the president's foreign policy team. Uh, and I think that the president now knows, his team now knows, that there's a lot of support in the Congress for the president to waive, have this waiver. But Raul, one other point is worth making. This is the first significant vote in the House of Representatives in affirming the U.S.-India alliance since, I would argue, the India civilian nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in between, there have been a lot of things that the executive branch has done, but this is getting people in Congress on the record saying uh, that the relationship is very important. Now, that's interesting because this comes at a time when India has had its own position on the Russia-Ukraine war, and there was some concern that not towing Washington's lines uh, may have some consequences for Delhi, despite India taking an independent policy on the Russia-Ukraine war. You've gone out of the way uh, to help with these legislative amendments. Why have you done that and what does that say, according to you, about the mood in the U.S. House of Representatives? Well, I think I had the credibility because I was critical uh, of India's abstention in the United Nations. I believe that uh, uh, we should be condemning Putin, that what he's doing in uh, Ukraine is 
uh, is unconscionable. Uh, but when you have important strategic relationships, uh, we can speak candidly about differences, but ultimately we need to strengthen that relationship. And I think I had the confidence of a lot of colleagues because they know I'm an independent voice. They know that I uh, have been critical at times of uh, policies where I disagree, uh, but I was able to convince them that ultimately the U.S.-India relationship is so important for uh, liberal democracy in the 21st century, uh, and that's really what carried the day in the House of Representatives. When it comes to weapon purchases from the United States, uh, the, the sense in India is while we've been buying more weapon systems from the U.S., including attack helicopters, there usually is a big price differential. Uh, Russian weapon systems comparatively cheaper also on certain weapon systems like the S-400 or uh, the nuclear submarines. We get weapon systems from countries like Russia which America ordinarily doesn't give to nations like India and therefore while America wants India to buy more, India often doesn't get the kind of high-tech weaponry which countries like Russia would make available at reasonable prices. These are the challenges we have to work through and we need to have a security agreement first before we, we can have a, uh, just a business agreement. But the reality is, in my view, that the F-35 uh, and other American uh, weapons are of better uh, quality of higher technology than the Russian, uh, the, the, the Russian SU-57 uh, or uh, other technologies. And that is why uh, they're a higher cost. Uh, we've seen some of the failure of Russian technology in the, in the war. Uh, but we have to figure out how do we make it uh, at a price that's affordable. The other issue is, candidly, that uh, the United States is uh, uh, understandably very reluctant to be exporting the defense manufacturing of our sensitive technology. Uh, Russia makes it more available. Uh, but in my view, if we can have India treated uh, like the NATO plus six, we have export, uh, export uh, favored status to countries like Japan, South Korea, Israel, Australia, uh, plus NATO, I think India should be included in that group, and I have been working to get India included. That would allow us to uh, help negotiate uh, a better and stronger defense agreement. And what's been the feedback on this effort to try and ensure that India is kept at par with a country like Japan or South Korea when it comes to weapon systems? So it's not seen purely as a commercial contract between two governments, but also something which helps global security uh, by this pact between two democ democracies? There is growing momentum for that. I originally introduced that in 2018. It didn't go anywhere. I think the Quad uh, and the arrangement uh, with the Quad uh, that India is participating in has helped. I think the concern about the Chinese potential invasion of Taiwan uh, has helped. Uh, the uh, Chinese threats to India's sovereignty on the border uh, has helped. Uh, but, you know, we have to work towards it because, as you know, uh, since the Nixon years, uh, India uh, has been uh, reliant on Russia. It was partly because Nixon uh, went through Pakistan to have uh, the uh, detente with China. Uh, and since then, we've been trying to reorient the relationship. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have work to do. Finally, by when do you see these uh, waiver for the armed sanctions actually coming through? You've taken a very important step, uh, but by when do you think this will be a done deal? Well, ultimately, it's the president's decision, but I have had conversations with uh, the senior leadership in the White House and uh, the State Department. I anticipate the president will do it uh, soon, but the, the relationship is now much more secure because there are 300 members of the House who have voted for it. Uh, there are a few points uh, people should uh, leave this uh, interview with. One is the relationship has bipartisan support. It has overwhelming support. Uh, and many of us in Congress view it as one of the most important strategic relationships uh, for the United States. Of course, I have a, a personal heritage. I was born in Philadelphia in 1976, but my grandfather, Amarnath Vidyalankar, uh, worked for Lala Lajpat Rai, uh, went to jail uh, in Quit India's movement in the 1940s. Uh, so I have a great uh, belief in India's possibility uh, as a liberal democracy and the uh, contribution it can play in the 21st century for the world. Congressman Khanna, you've been a critic of some of India's 
foreign policy moves in the past, but on these uh, uh, sanctions and helping ensure that we can work towards a waiver, your leadership has been quite exemplary for the effort that you've made and for having taken our time for this interaction. Thank you very much. Congressman Rohana from California. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rahul.